Hey there, everyone. Doing another Wednesday Easy Chair Chat. 2020 has been a crazy year, and there are a lot of prophetic words floating around out there on the Internet and in sermons about this year. And so the question is, is we need to discern these words. Are they from God? Are they legit? Or are they not? How can we rightfully do that? First Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21 says, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. So if you're disregarding these words, then that's wrong. But if you're just gullibly drinking them in, that's not good either. You need to test those words. So how do we test them? Let me give you seven principles or criteria to test the word if it's from God. The first is, is it in agreement with Scripture? 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Is that word scriptural? Does it line up with Scripture? If it is, receive it. If it doesn't, reject it. A second principle is, is if that word has a predictive quality, does it come to pass? What was said? Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods must be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what the prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. So that's pretty straightforward. We obviously don't execute people anymore for words not coming to pass, and that that's good. But we still have to determine did it come to pass? So someone, I believe, can have a legitimate word from the Lord, a dream, a vision, but interpret it wrongly or prescribe a different timeline. Maybe the Lord gave no timing on it, but they say in three months or a year, and that's from their own mind. So I guess give that person some slack. But two exceptions to that rule is uh, the timing again of the matter. Messianic prophecies spoken, let's say, by Isaiah, for instance, were spoken in his lifetime. His contemporaries heard those, but it didn't happen in their lifetime. In fact, it maybe took 700 years to be fulfilled. So that word may have a long time to be fulfilled. The second is the repentance factor can change the whole dynamic of it. And I think of Jonah speaking a word of judgment on Nineveh. In 40 days, God is going to destroy that city. But remember, they repented, and then Jonah's word didn't happen that he spoke because they repented. But, but that's a well-known principle in Scripture. An example of that is found in Jeremiah 18, 7 and 8. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. Okay. The third principle is, does it bear witness to the truth? Jesus in John 16, 13 says, But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So you as a Christian have the Holy Spirit within you, and the Holy Spirit will confirm that word to you. Does it, do you have a sense that this is from God? Or do you feel uneasy in your spirit about it? If you do, then, then wait on acting on that word, for instance. The fourth principle is, does it edify, exhort, or console? And I'm taking this from 1 Corinthians 14, 3 and 26. 
But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. And verse 26 says, when you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. So that word should not confuse, divide, or cause fear. And it could even be a strong word of warning, but offer the hope of repentance. And that encourages. Fifth principle, does it produce obedience? And I'm going back to Deuteronomy 13 here. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place, and he says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to him. So that, that word should have something for us to do in it. Maybe to love God, to follow him, or to repent. Sixthly, does it bear good fruit? Jesus said in Matthew 7, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. What kind of fruit does this word produce? If you're able to determine the fruit of the prophet giving the word, well, that's a good thing. Do they have a long track record of being accurate in hearing God? What kind of fruit is produced in you by that word? Does it cause you to love God more and follow him more closely or to fear and pull away? And the final principle is, does it exalt Jesus and glorify God? John 16, 14 says, He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. So it will be a word that points to Jesus and gives glory to God and affirms to you that God is in control. Well, let me turn this over to Kathy and let her share a little bit. Hi, it's a truth would be known. This is take three of this, but hopefully it seems fresh that, um, what we're saying. Um, and I think what Ed's saying is so timely and um, clarifying. Um, when we ended last week, um, you know, there's such a desirableness to hope and have a positive um, desire for what's the future, for the return of the Lord. I think we were meant to live by a positive hope in front of us. Um, in John, first John, he says, he who has this hope in himself purifies himself, even as Jesus is pure. So one thing that I, in these two verses at the end that, you know, was alarming is that there's two ways that we can handle the sense of the presence of the Lord, his coming or our daily approach to him. And one is confidence and the other is shrinking back. And it, it really seems to make sense that we would shrink back because we know who we are and he is holy. Um, just like Peter, when Jesus re was revealed, revealing himself as um, the miracle worker with the um, fish, he said, depart from me for I am a sinful man. That could, was his only response. It's like, I am, am this and you are, are so great. Um, so I thought that maybe it'd be good to understand a little bit more about shrinking and what it looks like, what, it, where it comes from. Um, Jesus, I think was very clear. And this would be John three twenty. for everyone who does evil deeds, hates the light and does not come to the light so that their deeds will be exposed. But the one who practices the truth comes to the light 
so that they may be plainly evident that his deeds have been done in God. So the word um, shrink, shrink back, it's like kind of two um, words together. I think we think of the word hyper, if it's, you know, hypertension, um, just above. But the other word is like hooper or hoopo. And so this means like underneath and avoid. And it's it's only, I think, used four times, and all of them aren't very positive. And the one that's kind of a more literal picture is that you have Peter who, you know, by this vision realizes we got to open the doors to Gentile believers. And he starts getting freed up as a Jew and, you know, just like um, feasting and enjoying Gentile believers. But there's this point where some Jewish believers come along and all of a sudden, he shrinks back and so much, um, so displeasing was that, that Paul, you know, rebuked him for that. So, um, you know, we can see how that definitely fits with approval of people like, oh, well, I'm, I'm gung ho on something until these certain people are in the mix and I shrink back. That is not, that's not a, a good thing. Um, so, also, because of the holiness of God, we can understand why there is a natural sense to hold back. And this actually is in Jeremiah 30, verse 21. One of their own people will be their leader. Their ruler will come from their own number. I would invite him to approach me and he will do so. For no one would dare approach me on his own. I, the Lord, affirm that. So there is an innate sense why you, you've got to have something to approach a throne. Okay, but something has so changed, I think even beyond what we can rationalize or reason out, by Hebrews 4.16, it's again talking about a throne. Therefore, let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace. So what has happened from our most holy God who knows human nature, that we would go from shrinking back, not daring to approach, to actually being confident. So by Hebrews 7 verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. God has done something to cause himself, his throne, the gospel to be a magnet to us. And as we would go on into Hebrews 10, verse 19, I mean, it's layer after layer that he has done, that his presence on a daily basis and the thought of facing him at the end of the age draws us. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the fresh and living way that he inaugurated for us through the curtain that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in the assurance that faith brings, because we have had our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. I read that so fast. It really deserves piece by piece of how God has made himself a magnet to us. And it is clear he definitely wants us to approach him confidently. In whom we have boldness and confident access to God by the way of Christ's faithfulness. Ephesians 3 verse 12. And then in 1 John 3. And by this we will know we are of the truth and will convince our conscience in his presence. If our conscience does not condemn us, we have confidence in the presence of God. So as last week's ended on two verses that definitely had the exhortation for confidence, but also the warning about perish or of shrinking, I just want to read this last one again and hopefully we have more um, certainty or will have more certainty that we are not shrinking back. This is Hebrews 10, 37 through 39. For just a little longer, and he who is coming will arrive and not delay. 
but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I take no pleasure in him. But we, and Lord willing, we are not among those who shrink back and thus perish, but we are among those who have faith and to the salvation of our souls. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that good word. So let's uh, close in prayer and come boldly to that throne of grace. The Lord, it also says in the book of Hebrews that you are a consuming fire. And like the Jews of the Exodus, we would be terrified to come into your presence. But you have made that way possible. Your arms are outstretched to us because of Jesus and what he has done. He has shed his blood that we could be in relationship with you. So we do come boldly to our great God. And we offer these words to you, Lord. I pray that you would bless them and anoint them. And these hearers, that they might be encouraged and strengthened in their most holy faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless. Have a great day.